G'day viewers, in this segment I'll tell you about the transmission control protocol. And yes, this is it. This segment is about TCP and how it works, the one you've been waiting for. TCP implements a streams transport service that's accessed by sockets, and it's the protocol that's used to uh, transfer the vast majority of content that's used on the internet today. So all of these devices implement TCP as well as IP. Okay, here are some of TCP's features. I'm going to go through some of them a little bit. However, you're already in a position to understand the bulk of them because they use the concepts that we've worked up to at this stage. TCP provides a reliable byte stream service. I'll talk a little more about what that means. That's the service interface. In terms of implementing it, that service is implemented using connections. Okay, we know how they work, how we set them up and tear them down. The reliability is provided with a sliding window that uses an adaptive timeout. Check, we've seen how that works, the sliding window and adaptive timeout. I'll tell you some of the TCP specific details of it though. TCP also includes flow control to help uh, slow receivers handle fast senders. Well, we've seen how that works too. So uh, these are the features that I'll cover just very briefly in this segment. Um, we will next time, later on, We'll also look at another topic, congestion control, which is implemented by TCP. This is to match the sending rate of the sender to the available capacity inside the network. This is a major portion of TCP, but we're going to treat it as another topic just because there's so much there. So really I'm mostly talking about reliability functions today. Okay, so this reliable byte stream model. In a reliable byte stream model, as you surely guessed, Message boundaries are not preserved between send and receive calls. So the, the bytes that are sent down from the sender, they are delivered to the other side reliably and in the same order. So that when you read them, you get what you would expect. But the, the units in which they're sent down, there are no message boundaries that are preserved. Just as an example of that, you can see here the sender is sending, makes four calls to send and it sends half a kilobyte uh, with every call. So two kilobytes are sent to the network. On the other end at the receiver, it would be possible to make a single receive call and receive all of those two kilobytes at once, depending when they came in and when the timing of the calls, what the timing of the calls was. Um, this is what I mean by message boundaries are not preserved. It's really a stream of bytes that we're sending from one side to the other. A reliable byte stream also gives us another opportunity to combine things. This byte stream is bidirectional, so we're able to transfer data in both directions. Because of this, on segments, TCP segments that are sent in the network, we can piggyback control information going in one direction with data that's been sent in the opposite direction. Control information is information like the acknowledgement number, for instance. So as you can see here, there is a, a data segment that's been sent from A to B. It's carrying information. That's great. As well as that, it's also carrying here a little bit of control information, ACK numbers, for the reverse stream of data that's been sent from B to A. That's the packet down here. And similarly, that uh, segment down there is also carrying control information, the ACK, for data that has just gone in the reverse direction from A to B. So these segments are combining information uh, from both directions. It's called piggybacking. It's quite clever. So what we'll do just to see a little bit of TCP is we'll look at the TCP header. This is a good way to see the features of protocols. Here's the header shown in this picture here. First up, it has ports. These identify the apps which are uh, using the transport service. We talked about ports previously in, with, when we covered the socket API. Uh, here in the header, they carry the 16-bit identifiers. Okay, well next comes the sequence and acknowledgement numbers. These are used to implement the sliding window. TCP uses a selective repeat style of sliding window, and the sequence and act number really carry uh, byte positions uh, rather than segment numbers. So that's one difference right there. I can tell you a little more about the sliding window just in terms of how TCP implements it. The ACK that comes back is what is called a cumulative ACK. It tells us the next expected byte number in sequence. So if you like, according to our Fermat 
terminology. This is just LAS plus one. It's telling us the next byte that's expected. In addition, and optionally, TCP acknowledgements can contain selective acts. And these are some of the hints we mentioned are sometimes used with selective repeat to try to tell the sender what's going on at the receiver in terms of its buffer state. SAT blocks in TCP can specify up to three byte ranges that are being received beyond the cumulative ACK. So an ACK that's going back from B to A might, for instance, say, Hi, I'm an ACK, and I'm ACKing up to all bytes have been received up to uh, byte 99, and the next byte I expect is 100. That's the cumulative ACK. And in addition to that, I also happen to have received bytes 100 to, uh, sorry, bytes 200 to 299. So you can see there's a bit of a hole here. We don't know what's happened to bytes 100 to 199 yet. At the sender, TCP uses an adaptive timeout strategy, retransmissions based on this adaptive timeout, to resend the data. Um, when that timeout goes out from the, from the highest acknowledgement number, the next expected byte onwards. However, and this is the clever bit for TCP, TCP uses a variety of heuristics to infer loss quickly to, so that it can resend the data and avoid these timeouts. And it does that by using information in the ACK stream. There is a three duplicate ACKs rule of thumb that's used to find loss. Now, what's that all about? Let's see an example, and I think it'll become clear. Okay, so here is an ACK going back. This is just the first ACK for ACK 100. Suppose next we get an ACK for 100 again. That's a duplicate ACK. Our cumulative ACK has not moved, so we've sent the same value again. And in addition, maybe we get a SAC block saying, oh, not only have I got up to 99, so I expect 100, but I've also gotten 200 to 299. Next ACK, number three, that's a, another duplicate ACK because it says the cumulative ACK is now still at 100. But oh, it looks like I've received some new data. It's just it was further out. And finally, there is the fourth ACK here, or the third duplicate ACK. <coughs> it says I'm still at ACK 100, but I've now got also bytes 200 to 499. Well, at this stage, you don't have to be a genius to think to yourself, well, I guess that bytes 100 to 199 have just been lost. That's what happened. That explains this whole. <clears throat> the sender uses this heuristic to decide that that data range has been lost and resend it, hopefully before the timeout goes off. Um, three duplicate acts is used as a little bit of trade-off because we don't actually know for sure if that packet is late in the network or lost. Um, it could have been late just because it took a slightly different path through the network. So waiting for three duplicate acts provides a little bit of robustness against some packet reordering. Um, and you can also see here, by the way, that if I simply had the act numbers and none of this, these SAC blocks, I could also make the same guess, that the next thing beyond 100, that's probably what was lost and sent it. So TCP uses these heuristics. We'll see a little more about it when we get to congestion control because this overlaps that subject. Okay, so what else is in this header? Well, not too much actually. Um, you can see here there are some flags that are used to set up connections. These are the sin and the fin flags. And there's also a reset to abort. Um, these are simply flags because these messages also reuse the sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. For instance, to set up a connection with a sin, the sequence number here is used as a parameter instead of having to carry it elsewhere in the packet. Um, and there's also a window size you can see that's used for flow control. Like uh, Sequenac, this is measured in bytes rather than in segments. And this is the number of buff bytes of buffer space remaining or units of buffer space remaining relative to the value of the ACK. Okay, so that's it in our quick tour of TCP. Um, now it turns out that there are many, many quirks with TCP that you can learn about if you study TCP in detail. Um, but in some sense, these are all in the details. We've gone over the main ideas uh, so that you should be able to understand how the sliding window connections and flow control, the key bits of TCP work. 
The only bit we haven't really talked about, which is key to the functioning of TCP, is congestion control. And that's a subject we'll get to in the next unit.